and then um, in general, I think good conversation for like community. What, the, yeah. what is what is the knife community? What is the community yep. around? You this can ask ABC? me like what what sharpeners I like clicked with here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. want. It's black though. It's on a delay typically. Yeah, it's on a delay. We're good though. I think we're going. Hey guys. <laughs> we're live. We're live. We're live. Cool. Woo. Somebody uh, in the in the comments, let us know how the audio sounds. I think we got it all dialed in, but uh, we'll look forward to hearing you guys, seeing that, so that you know we you hear us. <laughs> you can hear us words <laughs> on the thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be good. <laughs> well, guys, we're joined by Lucas Burnley uh, from just up the road in Bend, and uh, he probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but uh, just great guy, awesome knife maker, uh, and more than that, kind of brand builder as you've uh, as you've built up yeah. a community and Thanks, man. just the. Uh, it really seems like it's focused around um, makers making just a real genuine connection yeah. from product, understanding where it comes from, and happy to have you here, man. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah, good to have you just up the road <laughs> in Oregon. There's a few companies here in Oregon that uh, that we get to work closely with. Yeah. Uh, CRKT's yep. here, and you work really closely with them, and we've got a good connection with them as well, as, yep. as well as a few others. Yep. Yeah. This was kind of a neighbor visit. I just realized I'm like... Is are a couple hours away and like hadn't yeah. been down it's the perfect reason to come say hi yeah it's been it's been great having you man uh we've been shooting a few videos having some fun in here and it's been a blast having you in and i don't know like when you were like come i want to come down as a knife maker and learn how to sharpen knives i was like what okay let's do it like <laughs> well it's funny like being a knife maker it, it's it's super varied right and right. so there's always areas where you can learn a specialized version of a skill set. And there's a lot of so times like, we're not focused on that. There's yeah. so many ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of, I'm, I've learned a lot actually. And just, just preconceived notions about different sharpening methods and techniques and like what's achievable. Um, that's very cool. It's been fun, man. Yeah. yeah sure. And we also, like we have all our digits and like, I know. <laughs> so Josh right. is the only one who just cut himself. Like, literally right know. before we went live, like, <laughs> like ah, dang it. <laughs> Just sitting over here at the spring assisted butte here and just you know got the tip right into the we were so close uh, <laughs> almost made it through yeah well okay we gotta kick this off uh i'm carrying the oh. the work sharp bench made bug out that was just what was in my pocket i think it's fun to show what uh what we were carrying around kyle what do you care i don't know why this was because you not good i probably nothing that if you've watched this a lot you've never seen before but i've got the pair of three you gravitate weight. to that a lot it's classic it's my like go-to daily carry i'm mm-hmm. not afraid to like do anything with this knife like i've got my pretty boys that i probably have a little bit more delicate on but this thing i'll just use for whatever and yeah that's it's my go-to yeah for sure spider goes are always rad they're like nice tall grind yeah super mm-hmm. slicey mm-hmm. they're thin overall like mm-hmm. yeah yep classic yeah man what, what do you got? got i've got an old tuna prototype i feel like if i've been on video in like the last couple of years it's probably been this same knife that's uh-huh. awesome gets a lot of pocket time you said so. that was the first tuna yeah this was the first tuna. wow so yeah yeah this was actually the one that i submitted to crkt hmm. and then they sent back to me because i was like can i have my knife back <laughs> normally yeah. a lot of times you don't get them back so i wanted it back but, yeah, yeah. Right on. So well the first target. one that's yeah. pretty cool yeah. one yeah what so, steel did you use when you uh this is cpm 154 yeah you uh, said you like that i really do like we, you know we talk about steels and super steels and all this stuff constantly i like i like consistent steels based around a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as like a small shop too, there's a lot of value in working with steels and kind of learning your process for heat treatment and like how yeah, they yeah. respond. So, yeah. Yeah, totally different nice. process yeah. for different steels. Yeah. And so you master one thing, you get yep. good at it. You don't have to worry about reinventing yep. a heat treat process every time you make every a time. knife. Yeah, And I experiment with other steels, but there's there's steels that I just, I notice myself like always coming back to. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, CPM is one of them. It's good. It's good. I'm, I'm realizing that we should probably explain what's going on in front of us here for those that like <laughs> are just like tuning in. They're like, why is there a knife in the in the vice <laughs> on the live stream there? So we just got done. We made a video testing a bunch of like, testing, right? Having fun, having doing fun. a lot of different knife cuts, like right. showing how you could keep a knife sh- or test if a knife was sharp. Are they really a test if it's sharp? Is it more of an exercise and technique? Right. And then 
you know, Kyle brought these playing cards and he was like, oh, I think it'd be fun to like, I don't know, cut playing cards or something. And we're like, oh, dude, what if we like start throwing? Like, what if we could just like... Magician style. Yeah. Like and throw one th- through. Throw. <laughs> between us and Steven and Faith on the on the camera side of this, uh, we none of us know how to throw cards. How hard could it be? <laughs> Proved it's to hard. be really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. But like right as we're, we're like cleaning up, we like got to get ready to do this and Lucas just nails it. Yep. We luckily, Finally. we went live, and I, dumb me, I was like, it's Lucas's turn. I pan over to him, and he just <laughs> nails it. So it looks like he doesn't actually do it. If he, he nailed it. it. Josh's reaction is just... Yeah. <laughs> so here's here's the deal. You guys get a head start, but we're going to do a giveaway where uh, we basically say, all right, send us some footage of you doing the same thing, nailing a, nailing a playing card on an knife, either stuck through, sliced through, um, so if you get if you get footage of that now, maybe you can start practicing. Um, we'll do a giveaway. We don't know what the details are yet, but we were just like, that's too cool to not. So yeah, um, yeah there's your early warning. Be safe. <laughs> I'm, I'm having like a super knife maker response to this, which is the knife in the vise, like with the blade up. Like every part of my being is wanting to like take that and like uh-huh. put it down. <laughs> yeah that's it's, like it's screaming not shop, safe shop like, 101 yeah. like yeah you never leave a, you never leave a knife in a vice with the edge hanging out, hanging out. sorry yeah, just i just did <laughs> <laughs> we were like throwing the cards too and you realize like you you want it right and you're like putting some oomph behind it and there's moments where you're kind of inching forward a little bit and you're, you're like dude i was waiting for yeah a you know. couple inches out and it starts to get a little mm. spooky mm-hmm. but we got through we got it. Until you did yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> it's a nick. I've suffered worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any comments rolling in that uh, you get questions? I've got some from Instagram that I, I was wanting to throw Lucas's way. All right. Um, let's see here. Where should we start? Uh, Kelby Elman asks, what is your favorite knife to make? Ooh. Favorite knife to make. This is like a this is like a favorite food question, honestly. Mm. I mean, it comes down to how I've been working. I would say overall, over the years, probably one of my favorite knives to make is like my classic Quikens, the cord wrapped ones. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just something about making those that's so kind of familiar. Um, and I've done it so many times over the years. It's like can almost go to autopilot the work is still really enjoyable um yeah and i enjoy Hmm. the whole process do you start with i think you're saying this i forget do you start with a a laser cut blank or do you you have like a a a plastic laser oh i think on the niche i was showing you that yeah so i make knives like all kinds of different ways right like i'll do stuff that is fully manual um i'll do stuff with cnc mm-hmm. i'll like those niches i designed in cad made a plastic template on mm-hmm. my laser and then handmade like everything and else and just went to the, the band template. saw yeah. yeah i use the template as like a drill template so i go and i lay that out in a sheet of steel i go to the band saw and i start cutting out blanks mm-hmm. um yeah i just really like process so for me there's not like a consistent way of making a knife mm-hmm. a lot of times it's kind of like how do i want to make it Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. A little on the other other end of it, uh, Aiden Rod asks, "What's your favorite knife you've designed, and why is it the squid?" Oh, he's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that one is. This is like a tale of two children essentially, because there's the squid and there's the quiken. They both, for me, they were such pivotal designs. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've both been around for like, like, Quiken's a little bit older, maybe over a decade, wow. and like still popular mm-hmm. and selling, which is mind blowing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Squid is probably closing on a decade. Wow. So yeah, it's between those two. They're different though too. So it's like, oh yeah, how can I have a favorite between those? <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's mm-hmm. definitely one of those. Oh, Faith's got her hand up over there. Uh, I have Ryan Wordlin. I own a classic work sharp knife and tool sharpener. Only has the 40 degree and 50 degree option. How do I get my squid to laser sharp again? Did you pick that up, Stephen, in audio, or do we need to repeat that? We'll repeat. So I'll repeat it. Okay. Yeah, I got the the work sharp KTS, the original knife and tool sharpener, with a 40 degree and a 50 degree, or a that's 40 degree inclusive, yeah. or 20 per side, or 25 per side, 50 inclusive. Um, 
You know what angle those are sharpened at roughly? I would guess we're probably in like the 20. Yeah. That feels yeah. probably in there somewhere. Yeah, that blade thins out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, thins so. out. But it's still, it's a factory edge, mm -hmm. which is usually not like, you know. Yeah, perfect. or Perfect or yeah. super angled. So, yeah, I, would, I feel like, I feel like at that point you're close enough that you could, with a little bit of reprofiling, mm -hmm. you'll get back into the edge right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd start on the on the red or the coarse belt uh, razor burr on one side, and that would usually take, depending on the level of dullness, between like two passes if it's you know just seen some average use, not too far gone, uh, up to maybe five or six if that's like dull. It's been years, it's been hard work, uh, and you haven't sharpened it. But you're looking for a burr, and then switch to the other side, repeat the same number of strokes, so keep track. And then switch the belt down to the purple uh, 6,000 grit belt. And then just alternate sides, one on each side. Um, and when you're using the, the belt sharpeners, keep in mind, set the knife in the guide, then power on, and then pull the knife through. Uh, rather than running power consistently and then dropping the knife in, you're grinding before you're set in the guide if you do that. Uh, and then stop with the tip on the belt. Um, that preserves the factory profile. I had a, a nice little lesson in that because I hadn't used any of the powered sharpeners. And so going through that process, like it, you see like how controllable it actually is. Mm -hmm. You can, my biggest concern was like, oh, I'm going to remove material too fast. As long as you're not like the first thing I did was fire it up and drop the blade in mm -hmm. and you called me on that. And then you see like stopping in the tip on the belt, that right there, like will save a mm -hmm. blade. Yep. Yeah. You said you it's did that on the like on your two by 72 yeah. also like it's, it's not, super similar process yep you know yeah instead of removing it though like on a two by 72 you can come up to the belt yeah and pull off and so yeah. you don't have to worry about shutting the machine off and on that yeah that'd be a whole pain but yeah little learning curve but yeah, mm -hmm. super easy yeah scaled down technology yep. basically yep yeah got a shout out from uh raven the pirate hey, hey what's up sam what's up sam <laughs> he said it was cool meeting all you guys at blade Likewise, man. Likewise. Yep. It's really good to see you there. Fun to see you make the trip across the pond. Yep. Sure. I got, an, time. I got an important one here. Yeah. Rockbrave68 asked, how do you feel about pineapple on pizza? I love pineapple on pizza. How can you not like pineapple on pizza? <laughs> it's not even like a thing. It's just food. <laughs> Fair enough. Come That's on. Awesome. Pineapple. Here, here's the real trick, though. Like being from New Mexico, so it's, it's pineapple, ham, and green chili. That's, okay. the, that's oh. the actual proper recipe. Okay. Yeah. Let's try that. Yeah. Not Hawaiian, but that's the New Mexican style yeah. pizza. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Want some more? Yeah. Lay them out. This guy, uh, Ben Banters, uh, asked. Who's that? Uh, some guy. <laughs> Sounds like a troll. <laughs> <laughs> says, how does Luke maintain that winning smile and embodiment of all things manly? I just think about you, Ben. I think like <laughs> you're, you know, you're my like spirit guide up there, <laughs> up there, like he's yeah. past. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Um, I have Fallon student ask for more tips on using the Ken Onion blade grinding attachment for swords. Oh Ooh, for yeah, swords. It's a real deal. Yeah, um, I don't think we have a sword here, but here's the. Okay. I'll give you the rundown, or what, at least what, like, what I would do. Do a little chete? Oh. No. <laughs> well, I don't know what angle a sword is sharpened at. I would guess. <laughs> I would guess it's not super fine. I would chopper. I would guess. Like, I think it would depend uh, on the type of sword. Yeah. 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 Like the pirate sword, you know, kind of thinned okay. out. It's like this. You know, maybe that's more slicey. Type of thing? Big. The big question is: Is there like a secondary bevel? Right. Right. That's a yeah. That's a good. Yeah. Is it, is it a true, like, flat grind all right. the way, or... Or an apple seed, like, Japanese mm -hmm. style. Yep. Yep. It's a um, complicated question. If you're using the BGA, you're going to end up with that. Yeah, well, then, yeah, then the edge you're putting on is actually going to have a little bit of that convex mm -hmm. as well. Um, I'd say I'd say you'd start a little bit wider angle, though. 25, 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, up to user discretion, though. And then... Uh, the, I think the biggest secret to getting a consistent edge is that it's all in the hips. So get the get the tool set up in front of you, and instead of trying to like rotate here, 
like just just swing the hips so you're able to get the whole edge to come across the top of that belt at a consistent angle and you're not you know like drawing up and changing the angle get a nice solid base and it's all in the hips but also if it's a sword okay <laughs> if you might have to give yourself like a little bit of extra room so if you start out a little oh, bit that's... past and you give yourself like a working area to move to yeah that would help how big is the sword right that's like yeah key. we've got questions that's key <laughs> um, i got a question from marcus forbes would lucas ever consider making a liner lock squid xm liner lock squid xm <clears throat> we've actually talked about it um I think it would be a pretty fun project. I really like liner locks in general. They give some different possibilities for like material combos. Um, I really like shadow box scales, like what I did mm. on the on the Quiken where you have like mm -hmm. a little reveal. Um, so yeah, and actually, there may be there may be a squid coming out that is it's not the XM and it's not the standard size, but it is a liner lock. Mm. So all right, it's gonna be pretty cool. I think. Right on. That's. Yeah. Yeah, you've kind of got around, or you've experimented with some like different materials when you get like the tuner to CRKT, and you yep. you bring the G10 on G10 in on one side, yep. um, and then you have the frame lock on the other. But I like how you've you've done that. But yeah, it fun. I can see that like yeah. a liner lock does allow for some different material. Yeah. I was gonna say because a liner lock is, I mean, technically it's less strong than a than a frame lock. Is that true? Kind of not, kind of because if you think about your lock relief. By the time you get back to lock relief, mm -hmm. you're you're at maybe, you know, thirty or like forty thou, so yeah. forty thou in a frame lock and forty thou in a liner lock, same, pretty similar. Yeah. You also have the component of a scale on the outside of a liner lock, which, like, from a rigidity standpoint, like, might play a part. Mm. I think it in when we're talking about pocket knives, I think these are like the the very fine details yep. that like. It's conceptual versus like practical, basically, yeah. or theoretical versus practical. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like us cutting grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair. Fair. Uh, John Richardson wants to know what Lucas's favorite work sharp sharpener is. Oh, man. So, right <laughs> now, like the precision <laughs> adjust, right? Mm -hmm. is is up there i think it's just a really it hits like a real sweet spot as far as like the controllability which for me is a huge one right um and just and usability so mm -hmm. you're able to hit an angle maintain the angle easily um without the risk of removing too much material um i actually also i love this i think this is basically just like the classic sharpener just done very very well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's like a backpack sharpener toolbox truck i think this is yeah where my head's at for sure dresser nightstand yep. whatever just keep them touched up yeah yeah um and actually the the onion sharpener after having used it a little bit here i see some applications for it in the shop nice. um that like as a secondary op machine mm -hmm. even having like all like our belt grinders and stuff like there's like there's a place for it so i'm excited to experiment with that some more too mm -hmm. um, i've got one um Sam getting in here earlier, even the pirate saying hi and whatnot, just got me thinking about like this community that he, part of that we got to meet at Blade Show in person, yeah. which was so awesome. And it's one thing that um, Jared, who works for us, had mentioned about you when he heard you were coming. It was just like how engaged you are with your community. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about like what does that community mean to you, and and can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's like a it's like a broad question yeah um for me like community is essentially like the entire value of our industry mm. um it's what That's makes it. it makes it really interesting um as a maker it's what allows me to like provide for my family like there's a lot tied into this mm -hmm. uh, i started in the industry when i was really young and kind of came up through forums and then started doing knife shows and so it was really this like really organic process mm. of meeting people and like developing, I guess, like what people would think of as our community now. Um, so it was never, there was never this thought of like brand building in that sense of like, oh, I wanna build this like community. Um, and I'm really fortunate now to have that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just, I don't know, knives are, knives are a special thing because there's so much passion 
kind of around them and people like your first experience is usually as a kid with like a family member like there's a lot of i think value mm -hmm. inside of the industry and just inside of like the hobby mm -hmm. so yeah having a community that enjoys like interacting with each other i think just makes that way stronger um so like in our group people always say like come for the gear stay for the people and mm -hmm. i think it's really accurate because mm -hmm. it's it's the friendships and yeah. like the relationships that you build around it that make like anything kind of more interesting right mm -hmm. yeah i think there's so much depth to the uh i mean like the use of a knife right it's extremely broad and which which draws people from all sorts of occupations or hobbies or really any 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 life experience right. and I mean, you were throwing around the the phrase the game of knife yeah and just how how much how broad the simple tool of a knife yep. like where it can take you and uh and I think that's the cool part about the community it's a cool part about like you know we we're talking about this work sharp in general like we have a niche we make knife sharpeners you've got a niche you make right. knives and and knife related gear and yeah. like that's a that's a small niche in the grand scheme of the world, but it brings just a, a cool cross section of different people together yeah. and yeah and and feeds our families and like it's a cool way to be involved you know working in it and then supported by the community that's around that it's yeah I think it's a very unique thing and I'm sure there's other places where that's replicated but it's not easy to find something that's the same and this approachable I've only been in this job for a couple of years as far as the knife side of it goes and it's like. I have been blown away at just how approachable everybody is in the knife game. Like you can walk up to almost anybody and they're, it's never like this big head inflated ego thing. It's always just like people willing to talk to you about anything and yep. good mm -hmm. people all around. Yep. Information, like as a maker, one of the most interesting things about the industry is how open in general other makers are with information. And like not all like arts or, or trades are that way. There's a lot of secrets that exist in a lot of mm -hmm. industries. Knife making is wild because you'll see some technique at a show and you'll ask the maker about it. And like nine times out of 10, he'll, he'll like tell you how to do it. Or like, he'll be like, Hey, I will, next time I'm doing this, I'll like send you some photos. Like it's just super open. Uh -huh. And I don't really know what it is um, that creates that kind of like transparency mm -hmm. and just like willingness to help. But mm -hmm. it, it's a very, very cool feature like as like mm -hmm. as like a younger maker coming in being able to like access someone who has a lot more skill than you and knowledge and have them actually that, be willing to share is like it just shaves years off of I'm a learning sure. curve you know that's awesome faith what do you got for us uh, i don't know how to pronounce this but sam wants to know if you're going to make any more kihons kihons Key, there yeah. we go kihon so kihon kihon means basics is like a like mm -hmm. a a kata in martial arts it's like basic foundational um yeah i'll do i'll do more kions at some point it's so hard like <laughs> i have so many projects rolling like kind of all the time and i realized like i just started making a batch of quike and frame locks and i realized it had been two years since mm. i made them last mm. which is wild so take a minute I also have a follow-up from jack the grand he wants to know if he buys the ken onion blade grinding attachment if he should then use that for all of his knives only, or if he should use both. Jack was asking about the swords earlier. Is that no. true? <laughs> you should also use I, it for your sword. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how else you would sharpen a sword other than the blade grinding attachment, <laughs> frankly. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of blade. Yep. Um, guys, that was a more general question, right? That was like, do I use the Ken Onion Sharpener for everything all the time? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, that is frequently the sharpener that I go to. That's the sharpener I go to whenever I'm doing real sharpening. And then in the kitchen, I have a ceramic honing rod and on my dresser or in my pack in the glove box of my truck, I have a field sharpener and I'm constantly using the ceramic and the leather, um, I use the, I'll use the fine diamond on occasion if I've got something like I, I beat up a, a griptilian knife that I use around the, the shop, the yard. Um, I sharpen that almost exclusively on here. I don't take it to the to the blade grinding attachment in the in the garage. But I think once you get good at the blade grinding attachment, the idea is that you could swap out the knife and the muscle memory 
is the same for every knife. You adjust the angle on the sharpener, you're not adjusting the angle that you hold the knife. Mm -hmm. And so your muscle memory stays the same regardless of the knife and the sharpener is doing some adjusting to make sure it's getting the right bevel on there. I, I heard that a little differently, so I'd hear what like to hear your answer to this too. Would you keep using the cassette if you had the blade grinding attachment? The it comes on it originally or would you switch over to exclusively the blade grinding I would, attachment? I would Ooh. probably just run the blade grinding attachment. Um, and I would practice first mm -hmm. because you do remove the physical guide and so now you're you're technically freehand, although it's trained in with the, the belt mm -hmm. adjustment angle. Um, but I would I love the blade grinding attachment. I do too. I, I will say this, the, the guide is darn good for getting a sharp knife though as, as far as going through the progression mm -hmm. on that like i can create some wicked sharp edges and my bevel like if you're worried about reveal like your bevel will come out much more consistent using the guides until you get really good at the mm -hmm. blade grinding attachment so you've got to be willing to put some practice in like josh said to get used to holding yourself level and getting those bevels even if you're worried about that if you're not then go for it yeah. <laughs> but if it is a concern of yours the cassette will obviously guide you much better than just being freehand yeah. What is the cassette? It's that, uh, it's the triangle. Okay, so the triangle, right. So you have that's a right side, that. left side. Okay, that makes sense. So like, oh, that's the yeah. cassette yeah. on the... Okay, got ATS. it, versus like the grind, the blade grinding blade attachment. Blade grinding attachment. Yeah. Yeah. Which this so that was, that was actually one of my big questions too coming here. I was like, where, where do different sharpeners fit in the work that I do, right? Um, so like thinking about it from a custom standpoint, looking like, okay, is the, is the onion sharpener good if I want to sharpen a custom? Um, I think for me, like I can definitely do it. There's a learning curve, but I would be, I would be super comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. It's actually very similar to the way that I sharpen knives, like after I'm done making them in my own shop. Um, I think me personally for just pure maintenance, I think going to like one of the, you know, like this mm -hmm. just where it works so good um and i'm i'm definitely of the camp of like more often mm -hmm. so i like i think maintenance is much easier than like repair yeah. you know yeah but yeah and, and also seeing seeing these with a really fine grip belt um kind of made me view them in a different way because mm -hmm. you realize like you can you can do refinement without really removing much material super flexible yeah, these are like the 6,000 yeah. or the 12,000 on the blade iron attachment. Like they're just, they'd hardly polish your fingernail. Yeah. They, you can I put mean, your finger right on it and it yeah. isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to mess with this more. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uses. I mean, even just as like a detailed grinder, mm -hmm. just this narrow, I think it's got a lot of uses in a shop. I, I mean, I don't make knives, but I use it for... Just in general. Like, a, like deburring the inside of a pipe yeah. or something, yeah. just because this is narrow and the guide can come off and... Yeah. I've got another one uh, from Jody Ape, and this is one that I know we're opening a can of worms with, but I'd like to hear both of your responses. Uh, what is the perfect angle to sharpen at? <laughs> that's such a, like, I don't know if you know that's a loaded question, but it's just like a, there's not a, there's not one answer. Right. What's the application? There's no yep. one, one angle to rule them all, as we say. What are you, like, what are you cutting? Yep. What's the steel? I mean, there's, so, there's a lot in that. Yep. Right. If you had to pick a okay, best practice, best practice angle. Like if I just had to choose forever on every <laughs> knife that I have, you only get one angle. This is great. I love it. Like it's, Pin it's down. probably got to be twenty degrees, just because it's in the middle. Again, I would just go to average on everything rather than having some stuff that was super slicey and some stuff that was a. I think I would. I think I chopper. would average right in there too because, and the reason for that is, I think edge strength plays in a way like you can have a knife it, even at, at 20 degrees it's, it's going to cut everything you need it to mm -hmm. cut it's still going to be super strong mm -hmm. that's a that's like a, a win in yeah. my book so kind we of do a, a lot of our like we do a lot of our angle guides at 20 degrees so maybe i'm biased there because that's kind of how i like my muscle memory set to right like i just i could pick up a any stone and sharpen it yeah. about 20 degrees and i think it's just a good working angle no matter what you're putting that knife to mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd agree. I'd say 20 degrees is probably the best all around angle you could try to get to. Um, but they all, there's reasons we sharpen to different angles too. So 15, yeah. 30, whatever it is. Yeah. Like you, we talked about like, what is it? That tops, uh, El Chete. Like mm -hmm. it's basically a machete. It's a big machete. It's a big <laughs> knife. Um, I don't want that at 20 degrees. Like I want that thing at 35. Right. Like that would be a, that'd be a tall bevel. 
and uh, for what it's designed for, that would, it would suck. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> In a word. Although yeah. I think that it is CPM 154. It's a lot of it. Yeah. Big chunk. Yeah. 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 Well, that, it like ties into another question. So edge angle, but like also edge finish. We were mm. talking about that yeah. a little bit earlier, which is like a super toothy edge versus like a very polished edge. Speaking of polished, have you guys ever seen Rockstead knives? No. Okay. So that's like a homework project just for okay. fun. Look up Rockstead. It's a company out of Japan. They mm -hmm. do this finish on their blades that is like, it's like a liquid mirror and it goes all the way to the edge. It's, wow. it's insanity. Wow. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Like a, like a rouge? Like a, like a, we have no, like I have imagining no like, like a buffing a wheel? If I, if I actually, if I had to guess, I think they're probably doing some kind of like tool and die finishing. Okay. Hmm. Like it's a different level of polish. Wow. Um, it's Really beautiful. Yeah, you use stuff. the word liquid. I like that. It's I wild. can picture that, but yeah. I've never. It doesn't like, make sense. You see it, you're like, it doesn't make sense as like a surface on steel. Yeah. 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 Especially at the edge. And mm -hmm. they'll have these really defined, like, secondary bevels. Interesting. Yeah. It's very, very satisfying. Interesting. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> but, like, overall, do you think toothy or polished if you had to pick an edge? I lean toothy. Same. I like a polished edge, but I'm. The guy that likes a pretty knife in my pocket too, so it's that's pretty. part of where it comes from. Yeah. Um, I so. will quickly admit a toothy edge is a much more functional edge on a knife. If you're going to use that kind of a knife, put a toothy edge on it. But mm -hmm. I just like a polished edge. There's so when the precision adjust came out for us because of the level of precision that was achievable, partially at the price point. You know, Wicked Edge has been around for a long time. A lot of people own, own a Wicked Edge. They're significantly more expensive than a Precision Adjust. And so by providing that fixed angle system at a $50 price point to start, we saw a lot more of them in the market. And we saw a lot of people, we got a lot of new customers, people who hadn't sharpened knives before that we started seeing feedback from and images and people would people comment or message us and say like, Hey, look at, you know, either look at what I did or are you coming out with finer grits or I've got these lapping films. Like I wanted to take this thing to the next level and like showing off mirror edges. And I thought, wow, this is a lot of people who like my preference as a, as a knife user, I'm comfortable sharpening, um, is a toothier edge. But we had a lot of people who wanted this, polish or like just had fun taking it to that mm -hmm. level i think that's big so part that's of it, it. I, I think really yeah. enjoy putting we were talking all about of that. a sudden you're like the option is there for me to like progress and i, I there's a guide you're mm -hmm. able to take it to the next level yep it's i think that's, cool. that's a good way to describe it because that's kind of how i fell in love with it too yeah. of just like the work you put into it and you're done you're just like yeah like yeah. that that looks awesome i yeah. did that i put the work in like Finding different ways to get there. Like, <laughs> you can nerd out on it forever, man. And I, I dig it. So, mm -hmm. Faith, what do you got? Oh. I'll try to figure out how to say his last name. <laughs> uh, C. Lemon Sky, have you ever tested one side toothy and one side polished at the same on the same blade to see if it holds up any better than just toothy or just polished? Ooh, interesting concept. I think, I think my brain is putting it together that it still comes down to one edge. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to get your, the toothy is going to come, you, essentially you're going to get a toothy edge if you have one side that's toothy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or which side do you finish on? Cause is that like, if it finishes on the polished edge, then are you pushing all of those, uh, ooh, all those okay. teeth over and like getting rid of them? Okay. Could see that. Or in, in a small, yeah right okay so if you push it if you push the polish side yeah by the time that it's a true polish there's no micro serrations from right or they're just grip. they're just higher up and well so... and this is also like toothy on a on a stone is different <laughs> than toothy, toothy on, on a belt, belt. Yeah. yes yes i would i think you're gonna cut in circles that's what's gonna happen <laughs> yeah. you're gonna be like ah! <laughs> The toothy edge is just gonna pull. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be like, gonna be like a chisel ground knife. It's impossible like, to cut straight lines. I, I saw some content on this the other day. Um, okay, a while ago now. The other day could be any time. The last like year. You're gonna say the Gabe method, aren't you? Um, I think it's the Gabe method. Is what this is. Is some some guy. I don't know if that was first name last name. But I saw this in the in the chatter. Um, and the uh, account Cedric and Ada, Ida, uh, did a did a test mm -hmm. with this. 
I believe, where sharpened and then cut to uh, like a hemp rope until it dulled. And what did they do though? Is it a similar idea where it's polished on one side and toothy on the other? Or... I think he did that. Yes. And okay. uh, any, but I think there were some other factors at play. I'm not sure what the steel was of the knife and if he did a control or if mm -hmm. it was just like, wow, this is better than other things I've done. But like, I don't know if it was a different knife. So. Uh, it was a while ago. I'm not. I'm not saying he did did an experiment wrong. I'm just saying I remember something that was. There were still some questions. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We haven't done that experiment either. Um, Wait, what were the results? It was. It was surprisingly it good. Right? Lasted longer. Yeah, yeah, it did last longer. It did last longer. So interesting. Okay, that's worth a try. Yeah, it so would be. We kicked it around a long time. It's probably about time we just. I mean, yeah. you guys need to do that. <laughs> It'd be pretty simple for us to mm. to do that. I think we'd have to, I think we'd have to do, I and mean, we have like these five Wusthof knives that are the exact same. And we could try and do it, like you're saying, like do it with the belt and polish as best you can on one you side. Do one side at 220 yeah. and take the other side up to 6,000. Yeah. Walk it all the way down. Yep. Yeah. And then do the other one with the precision adjust. So you have a fixed angle. Yeah. Yep. 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 I'm curious what would happen with the burr. Like, do you end up, do you leave some of the burr? Do you just push, end up pushing it all the way over and like give it a quick strop? I'm not. I'm just loving, like, we're just nerding out right now. So hopefully all you guys are with us. Know, <laughs> but, like, my we can, we can go crazy on this forever, <laughs> man. Like, <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I don't see it making that big of a difference. Because I think that regardless of if you poly, if you kind of strop the polished edge first or the toothy edge first, I think but I think it is going to create an average. Yep. I, yeah, I think so. Otherwise, it's up higher on the bevel that the knife is actually doing the work. Right. Which that could be making a difference in like a sawing method, but the final edge is still gonna either be toothy or polished, and I'm not sure which. I don't like also sure which like would win. you get into like blade geometry, you could have things like a chisel ground blade that's hollow ground on the backside. Mm -hmm. So you're doing <laughs> things that like you can maintain certain levels of strength, but have like a really thin edge. It's like a, yeah, it's a rabbit hole. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you got over there, Faith? I saw the hand go up. Uh, no, you can't. Especially if they're nice scissors. Um, scissors usually have like a, it's a, it's a chiseled ground, I guess, coming from one side and it's about 45 degrees. Um, yeah, it depends on the level of, of scissors. So if these are like, you know, craft scissors, kitchen scissors, you know, not, nothing fancy, then definitely, um, there's a guide here. I'll see if we can get that held up. But there's a guide here that allows for the uh, the scissor to rest and be sharpened by the belt. The belt is pulling away from the edge, which is what you want, and basically removing burr, kind of polishing that edge. Mm -hmm. uh, use the fine belt, and that should get the results that you that you need. If these scissors are totally trashed, you can try the 220 belt, but um, that's kind of a last ditch effort, yep. um, and I recommend some some practice before you do that. That was my gut was like, just get some cheap scissors and just try. Yep. Because I mean, you have it from a functional standpoint, it fits. If they are, if you're like, your wife has very nice, like stylish shears, like probably not a great idea. Yep. If it's household scissors and you just want a, oh, a better okay. edge, just practice. Yes. I, I, yep. Yep. Like, it works. It does work really well. Cause I've uh, sharpened them on my two by 72, which is like mm -hmm. not ideal in any way, okay. but it <laughs> makes the scissors sharp. Yeah. And if it's, you know. Ten dollar pair of Fiskars. That's like yeah, yeah, keeps them yeah. Going. This is scaled down, so it's less scary than yeah. you know going out to a bench grinder. Um, and we've got the, the guide on both the KTS and the Ken Onion. So either either yeah. Power Marble has the guide for your household scissors. Yep, you can freehand scissors on a ceramic. Also, um, it, like I said, they've got that chisel grind, and so lay that flat. Make a reverse stroke so that you're coming away from the cutting edge. Uh, I guess yeah. You're, you're trailing with the cutting edge and that leaves the burr on the inside of the scissors so that when they bypass it actually self hones and, mm -hmm. and removes that burr um just give it a few snips and it'll knock that burr off and you're good to go yep yep practice makes perfect use a light abrasive yep any others i think so right. left. let's see cleared it out cleared it got through them all what else Let's see. Um, so we spent some time with, uh, we might've covered most of this, but like you talked about 
your favorite sharpeners and we, we had a couple of like sharpening misconceptions that we were talking about um, material removal was one of those mm -hmm. um, I think that's I think that's a big one that we'll we come back to briefly um, when a knife is made or you know whether it's custom or in the factory like it's sharpened on usually a 2 by 72 <laughs> or uh, some form of a powered a equipment. powered yeah. sharpener yeah. you know that's designed and you brought up this concept that I'm not saying material removal is good, but you brought up this concept that like knives are a consumable. Right. Um, they're meant to be sharpened, and whether you sharpen those on a on a diamond stone, on an Arkansas stone, on ceramics, at some level, material is being removed, and that's how like you have to in order to sharpen a knife. Mm -hmm. um, a power sharpener is is a faster way to get there, and if you don't abuse that, then it saves you time. And doesn't remove any any more material than you would if you were spending you know significantly longer right than using a manual abrasive but the learning curve is steeper yes a little bit steeper yep your risk at the outset is higher and yep. then it's just figuring out like yeah where do i need to be abrasive why what is what's the goal of sharpening like is it maintenance is it repairing a chip you know, mm -hmm. if you're repairing a chip or a broken tip, like a powered sharpener is like an ideal, like just automatically go there, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think a lot of people get in their heads around the powered sharpeners. They're a little hesitant to put their knives in them. Like they're just like, oh, I don't, I don't yeah. want to stick on that, my nice knife in that. And like similar to what you said earlier about the scissors, you can do the same thing with a knife. Like go out and get a 2 or $3 knife and get used to using it. Because once you do have it down, just like you on a 2 by 72 yeah. the first time you put a knife to it, I'm sure you're yeah. like... I'm going to screw this thing up, yeah. like get used to using the tool and then eventually it becomes like, you know, really easy. And then you're confident yeah. stepping up to it with any knife to be able to sharpen using that power sharpener. Now, if you're just at the point in your head where you're like, I can't, then obviously there's manual solutions out right. there too. But I just think there's a lot of people in that space that are like, ah, I'm afraid to put my nice knives in them when it just, it's just getting used to using the tool. Well, and that's the thing I mean, with a lot of knives, different levels, right? Like they become very special or you've got like significant financial investment in it it's so like understanding like how you're using your knives and like which sharpening system to kind of work around mm -hmm. i think it plays but mm -hmm. even like with the power sharpeners my first thought was like oh like okay i'm pulling my blade through essentially a like a, a you know a fixed jaw and a belt so my first thought was like well i would tape the sides of my Mm -hmm. bevel mm -hmm. just because i don't want to ink, like add more scratches to sure. the surface of a knife if it's a completely tool-based knife it doesn't I, I don't care like if it's one of my production knives it's just a beater knife i'm carrying does not matter yeah. there's a lot of in between 100 between like super high-end custom and like beater pocket knife mm -hmm. so i think with i think seeing these run and kind of understanding like oh great like yeah i can tape the sides like even, even for me, like, so when we go to sharpen a knife initially, you know, our edge might be 10 thousandths thick, no bevel. So that first material removal is substantial. Mm -hmm. um, when I get a knife back in to like sharpen for somebody, that was one of my biggest questions kind of around this. Mm -hmm. And I think for like my gut response is like automatically like bigger fixed blades. I go straight to this. Sure. Yep. Um, kitchen knives, knives. I go hunting knives. I go straight yep. to that. I think folders, I think the precision adjust, like again, based on kind of like my skill level yep. and experience so far is I just know, like I'm able to focus on an area or focus on an angle and have a ton of control. Yeah. And that's the other thing too. I think that it's a big visual thing. You're able yeah. to look down, you can see what's going on. Yeah. When you're nice in that guide, you kind of get lost and yep. like what's touching where and what's going on there. Yep. So, Especially totally if you're learning to sharpen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, the goal, any any skill that you're trying to learn is like understanding the technique and what's actually happening and like how to see the process. There's almost nothing that doing that at a slower speed isn't like a good idea. Right. It just yeah. works. Yeah. If you understand like, oh, how does a burr get raised? And you go 15 strokes and you're like, oh, that's the burr. Okay, I understand that now. Like mm -hmm. clicks. Forward. How do you okay yeah. going to the other side? Like okay, we're gonna stop. How do we remove it? It's different when it's moving at speed. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, David Barham wants to know what is the recommended sharpening angle for small wood carving or whittling knives. Hmm. Ooh. I I don't have much authority to speak on this, but from knowing knives and sharpening, I would encourage two things: a finer angle. And a, and a polished edge. Um, you're not looking for, usually a toothier edge is like you're popping a zip tie, you're breaking down cardboard, you're trying to, like you're using that I mean, stuff for, meat. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah. yep. You You're wanna, using like, that slide to... through this. Yep. When it comes to the grains of wood. Yep. 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 Like a chisel. You're, we're talking about like sca- like talking about Scandinavian knives. Yep. Right, where you have a zero ground edge that's mm-hmm. polished. Like the Scandi knives perform like perfectly for wood carving. Yep. That's like one of the yep. main applications. Yeah. So yeah, I would say like if you're you have a secondary bevel, I would go like 15 degrees yeah. mm-hmm. polished. You know, thickness of the blade. There's some little things that kind of come into play there. But I'm thinking of like the flex cut knives almost. Hmm. They have like a slight convex edge um, that's like highly polished. So if we're talking like a slip joint, you know, you get like a toothpick or some little knife that thin blade, I think 15 degrees. Yeah. So makes perfect sense. Yep. Yeah. I've got one for you. Heat treat. When you take a knife. Yep. That's been like you've got almost a finished knife here. You take it that two by seventy two. How concerned are you about the heat treat on that knife? So this is gonna be crazy. Maybe <laughs> um, when I make folders, I actually don't do any grinding <laughs> before heat treat. So I, I heat treat a blank, and I do all grinding after, and because it's more stable. Yeah. And with a folder blade, you don't want any warpage. Um, you have to be careful. It's a feel thing, and actually. If you're a lot of times, if you're gonna burn a blade, it's in the higher grits because you just you kind of dwell a little bit too long. Um, I actually think it's overall process. Once you kind of figure out how not to overheat a blade, it's much more forgiving. Hmm. So, what's the? How do you know when you're about to overheat a blade, or like what, what do you look for? So I I grind freehand um, for most most of my knives. I use fixtures for certain grinds that are real repeatable. Um, but it, there's, it's just a feel there's, well, I mean, one, your, I don't wear gloves or anything. I use a push stick. So my thumb is kind of always touching the blade mm-hmm. a little bit. And there's times where my hands are wet and I've got my thumb on a blade and I'll start to boil water and you're about two steps away from, you know, actually yeah. burning yourself, but it sizzles the steam off, mm-hmm. go into your quench tank and, and back up on the grinder. Um, yeah. I tend to grind pretty slow. So I, again, it comes down to that control issue. Um, I think that you, if you're grinding slow and you're, you're grinding on sharp belts in the right progression, it's pretty easy not to burn. Yep. Hmm. Right. If you get a glazed over belt and you're running full speed, like oh. you, you are just going to burn cause there's no, it's not like accountable. Right. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. you you recognize the belts that we are using as the Norton Norax yep, the belts Norax, yep. and which is a a stacked abrasive you know way yep. more about this than i do but they're designed to be to cool yeah as they you know the, the abrasive is engineered how it's stacked in there it's not just uh you know adhesive and like sand blasted yeah it's a structured it. abrasive so it's essentially like a really fine aggregate built into like these little like pyramids or trapezoid shapes mm-hmm. um super cool yeah. yeah i consider them refining belts so like for sharpening they make a lot of sense like i don't ever use them for material removal mm-hmm. um material removal being defined kind of as like changing the actual shape of like a bevel or mm-hmm. like a like a blade grind um refining means just like just polishing out like the last layer of scratches so sharpening i mean essentially once you've reprofiled an edge or changed an angle like we did yep. it's all refinement hmm. so or polishing. so Safe to say, safe to use to sharpen with yeah, without worrying right. about your heat treat. Correct. Yeah. Come yeah. On. I mean, you can, and same thing, like if you dwell. Oh, you could. Yeah. And you're running speed. You can, and you brown your edge. Do it wrong or something. Enough. Yeah. yeah. But overall, it's not a risk. Yep. If you can keep touching the knife as you're sharpening, you're not ruining your heat treat. Yep. That's nope. very fair. Yeah. Cool. Faith. Uh, Johnny Quesada says that he's seen people making, um, holders for the blade clamp and the precision adjust for stabilization. Is that something that we've addressed on our end or do we have mm. something in the works? Um, the short answer is no. And stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else you got? I don't know. Uh, any other comments or questions out there? We'll we'll probably we're aiming to wrap this up in about an hour, so we got a couple minutes. If you guys got any other questions, shoot them over. Mm-hmm. Oh, Faith's him. One yeah. last one. There it is. Right. Uh, from Steve L. Any advantage to doing a double bevel for kitchen knives, in your opinion? Yeah. Um, 
I don't see a problem with a double bevel. And I would say that like you're understanding that you're making that knife your own. Um, so there's this, there's this element that I am like, Oh, I want that knife to represent what it was intended to do. And originally almost all knives are put, uh, the edge that's put on them is intentional from the maker, the factory, whoever designed it. Um, but I'm also thinking of another way that this question could be asked though. Like you say double bevel, I'm thinking of like a, you're like a micro bevel. That's, like what, I heard. that's what I was, like, yeah. yeah, like, like the two edge. stage. Yeah. Um, traditionally I think that the phrase a double bevel it just refers to it's ground on both sides rather than a chisel grind or sure. single bevel. Um, but I oh. was answering that as like a, as a, as a micro beveled. You know. I think they, I think they both play, right? Like mm -hmm. if you look at, um, Japanese kitchen knives, there's essentially a knife for like almost every process. So mm -hmm. you know, like you have a knife for vegetables, you have a knife for fish, you have a knife, you have which type of fish, like what cut are you making? Mm -hmm. Um, European kitchen knives are more broad spectrum in general. Um, they're mm -hmm. a little bit like, I kind of think of them in general as like a heavier, like workhorse kind of thought process. Yeah. Um, you're chopping through bones. Mm -hmm. You're also, you're doing your vegetables. Um, but like in a way less, I don't want to say less refined. It's just a, a different way of approaching the process. A little more versatile. Whereas everything else on the other end is more right. kind of specified. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to blow out the edge on your, on your European chef's knife because you accidentally like went through like a chicken bone wrong or right. something. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so in that context, like a lot of European knives, they are, they are like V ground mm -hmm. or like double bevel. Yep. Um, but you see more of like the single, single bevel or actually that bevel that I was talking about where you have like a chisel and then a hollow on the backside. Like those are more like Japanese style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think they all have their place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also just add in there. It's like, how do you want to maintain the knife? It's right. something you want to think about too. So, um, Speak just when you talked about the chisel with the hollow ground, it was like it'd be a nightmare to take care of. I feel like to try and like maintain that knife, but it probably serves a great purpose and it probably slices like amazing. Really. Amazing. So, yeah. uh, but at the same time, like that European knife is going to be a lot easier to just take a honing rod and maintain and keep yeah. sharp mm -hmm. over time. So, it all depends on how much work you want to put into taking care of your knives yep. as well. Yep. Yeah. At some point, if you just say, you know what. I don't, I'm sick of sending this knife back to the manufacturer and being without it for two weeks at a time. Okay, like put a put a traditional V grind on there with a sharpener that you're comfortable using and maintain that edge. Mm -hmm. And maybe that gives you just as much joy because now you have that knife all the time and you're using it all the time rather than you know sending it back to a specialty sharpener every so often. Right. It's it's your knife, I, you know, it's a, that's a tough question to ask. I like a chisel grind for a lot of stuff. Um, and a chisel grind can be sharpened at home just fine. Yep, um, as long as it's not, you know, if it's something really, really special. Um, but, a, you know, a flat grind on a stone and then strop the backside. Mm -hmm. You know, usually a kitchen knife, you're going to use a bigger strop than the field sharpener. But, um, yeah. We had talked about, like, the... Like, I'm a big fan of these. Yeah, so yeah, like, the whetstone. Yeah, the whetstone. yeah I've, got, I've got one of these in my kitchen. And mm -hmm. one, I like the process. Two, it's super flexible. And you can do, you can do like your traditional, like, you know, zero ground Japanese yeah, knives mm -hmm. on it. It's like, for me, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to applications. So like whether we're talking about like how and why do you have an, an angle on a knife or what type of sharpening system you're using. Um, yeah, you can get by with one for a lot of different processes, but at a point, like to me, this makes sense to have in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. Like this makes sense to have yep. out in my truck. Yep. Like, could I have that in my kitchen? Absolutely. I just like, I yeah, like wet stones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, there's something to it. I think you know we were talking about this a little bit. The just the zen and feel of sharpening and the that time you get to spend with a with a tool. I mean, I, I like the tools that I, that mm -hmm. I buy that I use, um, and then spending time with them in a different way. Especially knives are really really unique that way. Um, yeah. You know, the case could be made that uh, people spend way too much money on some knives uh, because they're attached to the, you know, the components, the story, uh, dare I say, the maker who is who behind that, um, which is not un not unjustified, but it is, I mean, we're talking about a tool that's thousands of years old that has been used, you know, originally in stone, and like, okay, so at what point do we need to evolve that to, you know, lightweight right. super steels and right. like so okay we've got something that's it's a great tool i won't say these are they're overbuilt for the job but 
um, we've put a lot of time in, into making them things that we love, tools that we love. So sharpening is a way to spend time with that tool. Um, make it your own. That's yeah. what I love about it. I feel it. like we talked about yeah. that a lot, yeah. like in, in the, the quiet moments where it's like, where, you know, where did you learn sharpening originally? Like a lot of us when we were kids yeah. and mm -hmm. you're learning on something like, you know, like an mm -hmm. Arkansas whetstone or, you know, like a diamond rod or, or mm -hmm. something that got handed down to you. Like yeah. I've got a knife my grandpa gave me when I yeah. sharpen it. It's like almost spending time with yeah. grandpa again when you're sharpening that yeah. knife. You know, it's, it's those connections you can make mm -hmm. through those yeah. heirlooms. Yeah, you said something cool that was, uh, you know, like a, any knife has a, has a cost associated with it, a value associated with it, but that, that value exponentially increases with use and like the stories and the you know, it, it builds on the history mm -hmm. that it has. And so to you, it becomes even more valuable. And I think that that's part of the joy of sharpening it is you, you're able to restore the function to it. The knife, the knife still has the value to you. These stories, the connections you have, the adventures you've taken it on, whoever gifted it to you perhaps, mm -hmm. but taking it to sharpening and making it yours and maintaining something that has value, I think is you really You get pretty rewarding. heady. Yeah. Pretty fast because I mean, yeah. it is there's, you can attach a lot of importance to like the maintenance of something that takes care of you that like you can hand out. I mean, yeah. Or you could just sharpen your knife. Yep. Like, whatever you guys want to do. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. 99% of the time. That's what, that's what's happening when I'm like, all right, like, you know, going to go cut some, cut some sprinkler line in the backyard and fix a leak. Big fun. Yep. <laughs> all right. You call it. I think that's uh we're so right about time. Steven's giving us the wrap it up signal over there. Right. Think, yeah, so. thanks for joining right. us, guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Lucas, for being here. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, uh, thanks for making the trip down. Yep. Really good stuff. Yeah, good. Thanks for watching, guys. See you guys. Yeah. See you.